today is a big day for me, so I'm so happy to see you all here and also those who are online on Zoom. Uh, let's uh, start with my thesis. So the title of my thesis is Development and Tailoring of Low-Density Cellulose-Based uh, Structures for Water Treatment. Uh, Although 75% of planet Earth is covered with water, the still world uh, have a water scarcity problem. And that is because only less than 1% of this water is accessible fresh water. The rest is either salt water in the ocean or it's in the form of salt in glaciers. In addition to water scarcity, we have water contamination. Industrial and mining discharges, agricultural input, hospital and city sewage, all are uh, contributing in water pollution. According to the UN report, around 800 million people worldwide, which is one person in every 10 people, lack access to basic drinking water. It's been such an important issue that Sustainable Development Goal number 6 of the UN is clean water and sanitation. Different water purification techniques have been proposed so far. Each of these techniques have their own advantages and disadvantages, and usually in a water treatment system, a combination of different treatment methods are used to get the water with the right quality. In my thesis, we mostly were focused on adsorption due to its low cost, ease of implementation, and absence of secondary pollutants. In order to create adsorbent uh, with good properties, porous materials are very interesting materials due to their high surface area that can interact with different types of contaminants. But to create adsorbents that are efficient, but also they are eco-friendly, we need to have a transition from fossil-based materials to biodegradable renewable materials. We also need to use green and eco-friendly preparation processes to prepare these types of adsorbents. Cellulose is a highly viable material to perform this transition from uh, oil-based material to green material. First of all, it's highly abundant. In Sweden, 70% of lands are covered by forests, so it's really good to use these materials to prepare something that, is, that has high value. In addition, cellulose has excellent mechanical properties, and it has a unique surface functionality. So it helps us to modify the surface uh, to improve its interaction with different types of contaminants. Uh, wood is one of the major sources of cellulose. Uh, wood has a three-dimensional uh, structure with aligned cellulose fibers forming wood tissue. Uh, Fiber wall has, uh, fiber wall ha uh, has a layered structure composed of fibrils covered with hemicelluloses in a matrix of lignin. And CNFs themselves are composed of linear cellulose chain. In this uh, work, we mostly focus on cellulose nanofibril and cellulose fibers to create these adsorbents. Another group of bio-based materials are protein. Uh, Beta-lactoglobulin is particularly interesting because it's the major protein in whey, and whey is a cheap byproduct of cheese industry. Only in Sweden, around 700 kilotons of whey are produced each year. So it would be nice to transform these protein byproducts into efficient adsorbents. Uh, this, the complex uh, structure of beta-lactoglobulin is affected by heat and pH. So by performing a heat treatment at pH 2 and 90 Celsius degree on beta-lactoglobulin, we can affect its uh, structure, so we can start to de denature it. So the protein will be unfolded, and finally it would be segmented, segmented into a small peptide. A portion of these peptides can self-assemble and form protofilaments. And then these protofilaments will be self-assembled and form long amyloid nanofibrils. Usually in a heat-treated beta beta-lactoglobulin system, 
we have 70% peptides and 30% amyloid nanofibrils. Uh, this heat treated beta lactoglobulin is very interesting. First of all, because beta lactoglobulin is composed of around 163 different types of amino acids. So it has many different surface functionalities that can interact with different types of contaminants. So it would be nice for our application. And also, the amyloid fibrils that are formed by heat treatment of beta lactoglobulin. They have high aspect ratio and high mechanical properties, so it enables us to form them into the shapes that is useful for our application. With this introduction, the main goal of my thesis was to create green and bio-based adsorbent for the adsorption of organic solvent and oils, metal ions, and dyes. I divided the, re the result of my thesis into three parts in this presentation. The first part will focus on development and molecular layer-by-layer -layer modification of CNF-based aerogels for the removal of solvent and oils. In part two, we will focus on formation of biohybrid porous structures based on heat-treated beta-lactoglobulin and CNF uh, for adsorption of metal ions and dyes. We will study ambient dried aerogels and oven dried foams. And finally, in part three, uh, we focus on development of extremely highly charged fibers by a radical transfer polymerization. So let's go into details of part one. Uh, in this project, the aerogels were prepared by freeze linking method. In this method, a CNF gel was frozen in a typical freezer at minus 18 Celsius degree. So during freezing, the growth of ice crystal will push this CNF together, so they become very close to each other. And by choosing a correct chemistry, we can cross-link these CNFs. So when the ice crystals are thawed, the cellulose structure doesn't collapse. And then by performing a solvent exchange to ethanol or acetone, we can decrease capillary forces, and therefore we can dry these aerogels at ambient conditions. In this project, two types of physically cross-linked and covalently cross-linked aerogels were prepared. Physically, in physically cross-linked aerogel, calcium ions were used to physically cross-link the structures. And in covalently cross-linked aerogels, we used dialdehyde CNFs. So the aldehyde groups on the CNF uh, formed hemiacetal linkages and cross-linked the structures. Both aerogels that were prepared had an open porous structure, which is interesting for our application. So in the next step, we modified these aerogels by three bilayers of MLDL modification with three mesoyl chloride and enzylyl diamine. So by soaking the aerogels in three mesoyl chloride, the acid chloride uni unit of TMC reacted with cellulose. And then in the next step, by soaking it in enzylyl diamine, the amine group rea reacted with acid chloride unit. So by continuing this step-by-step -step reaction, we were able to form a polyamide layer on the cellulose structure. And since it was layer by layer and molecule by molecule, we had a good control over the extent of the reaction and the surface functionality. After doing three uh, MLBL modification, the aerogels turned hydrophobic so they could float on water surface without absorbing any water. In order to characterize the deposited layer, we had to make cellulose model surfaces because cellulose structure had a 3D complex structure, so we could not study growth of these layers on a 3D structure. So we prepared cellulose model surfaces and modified it with 5, 10, and 15 by layers of MLDL deposition. From this measurement, uh, we understood that these, these deposited layers are very thin and also they are very homogeneous. So after even 15 bilayer, the roughness of the surface was only 2.2 nanometer, which was lower than the initial roughness of cellulose surface. In the next step, we performed a scratch test. So the black area, the black square that you see here, is the scratched area and the white square around that are the scratched CNFs that are 
agglomerating around the scratch area. So we measured the thickness of the deposited layer on the cellulose, and we observed that the thickness after 3 MLBL deposition is approximately 1 nanometer, which is so thin. And since we had 3 MLBL on the aerogel, we understood that the thickness of the deposited layer on the aerogel should be approximately in the same range. Although the deposited layer was very thin, it had a significant effect on the wet mechanical properties of the aerogels, improving it almost 2.5 times. It also improved acid resistance of the aerogels, so the unmodified aerogel disappeared within 1 to 2 minutes in a 37% HCl solution, while the modified one could resist without any problem at least for 5 hours. And also the aerogels, since they were hydrophobic, they were useful for absorption of oil from water surface. In the next step, the absorption capacity of these aerogels for different solvents was measured. We observed that the aerogels can absorb between 20 to 35 gram of uh, solvent per gram of aerogel, depending on the solvent density. Also, after each adsorption test, we were able to empty the aerogels by vacuum filtration and reuse that aerogel. We performed five cy cycles of adsorption and desorption, and the aerogels were able to keep more than 95% of their adsorption capacity. Finally, we were interested to see the selectivity of the aerogels. So we prepared a mixture of toluene and water. Toluene was dyed red and water blue. And then we soaked a hybrid aerogel inside the mixture. And we observed that the modified part absorbs oil, and the unmodified part preferably absorbs water. In the second part, uh, we focused on creation of biohybrid porous structures for absorption of dyes and metal ions. Aerogels in this uh, project were prepared with the same freeze linking procedure. So, a mixture of dialdehyde carboxymethylated CMFs with HPSs uh, were frozen, and then growth of ice crystal pushed the mixture together. CNFs were able to create hemiacetal linkages and cross link the structures, while ANFs were just physically uh, locked in the structures. So with this method, we could create wetter-stable aerogels with open porous structure, and the majority of pores had a dimension of around 50 micrometer. An interesting property about these aerogels was their amphipilicity. We had uh, beta-lactoglobulin in these aerogels, and beta-lactoglobulin is an amphipilic molecule, so it is a uh, cationic below pH 5.2 and it's anionic above pH 5.2. So our aerogels had a pH tunable surface charge and it enabled them to absorb or interact with both cationic and anionic contaminants by adjusting the pH into the correct value. Uh, we tested the absorption capacity of the aerogels for brilliant blue and Congo red as two anionic dye and methylene blue as a cationic dye. Uh, we observed that the adsorption capacity for methylene blue as a cationic contaminant was highest at pH 8.5, since at this pH both beta-lactoglobulin and CNFs are negatively charged. But for anionic contaminant, the highest adsorption capacity is at lower pHs, since at this, this pH HPS is cationically charged. And it's probably due to the charge-driven interaction and entropy gain due to the release of counter ions. That is the driving force for this adsorption. With the same way, uh, we tested the adsorption capacity for lead and chromium in the pH range of 2.5 to 5.8. At this pH range, lead exists in the form of PV2+, but chromium exists in the form of hydrogen chromite or hydrogen dichromate, which is, or dichromate, which is an anion. So the same thing was observed that lead had highest adsorption capacity at higher pHs, but chromium had higher adsorption capacity at lower pHs. Uh, in the next step, reusability of the aerogels was tested, since reusability is an important parameter both from economical point of view and environmental point of view. 
So after each adsorption, uh, after each adsorption, uh, the adsorbed contaminant was desorbed. Uh, to desorb cationic contaminant, we use 0.01 molar HCl solution, and to desorb anionic contaminant, we use 0.01 molar sodium hydroxide. And then the regenerated adsorbent was reused again. And this cycle was repeated three times, and we observed that the aerogel could keep more than 95% of its adsorption capacity for cationic contaminant and around 85% for anionic contaminant. In addition, the selectivity of the aerogel for lead in the presence of calcium and magnesium as background ion was tested, and the aerogels indeed showed a significant selectivity for lead. Uh, the aerogels that were prepared in this part uh, were prepared by freeze linking. And in this method, we have to use a solvent exchange process and solvent exchange the aerogels to ethanol or acetone to decrease capillary forces and be able to actually dry them in ambient conditions. So in the next project, we were interested to see even if we can eliminate this solvent exchange process and make the aerogels even, the production of these aerogels even greener. So in the next project, we focused on making oven-dried foam. Uh, Heat-treated beta-lactoglobulin is actually a surface-active material. So by creating a beta-lactoglobulin dispersion, and then by agitating it, you can create a foam. So the goal of this project was to use heat-treated beta-lactoglobulin as a natural foaming agent and CNFs as foam stabilizer to create a highly stable foam that can be directly dried in the oven without collapsing. But to be, do, to be able to do that, we, need to first, we needed to first study the foaming pro properties of heat-treated beta-lactoglobulin and know if this uh, surface activity comes from peptides or from ANF. We also knew that HBS is amphiphilic, so pH has a significant effect on that. So we needed to also know the effect of pH on the foaming properties of the aerogels. <coughs> To do that, uh, four dispersions, uh, one from pristine beta-lactoglobulin, the other one from heat-treated beta-lactoglobulin, and also from the individual ANFs and peptides were prepared. And then they were agitated to create a foam, and the foamability of these dispersions was measured. Also, their foam stability was analyzed by measuring the half-life time of these foams as the time required for the foam volume to decrease to half of its initial volume. From this measurement, first of all, we observe that a heat treatment is necessary to improve the foaming properties of beta-lactoglobulin. Also, we observe that the foaming properties mostly come from peptides, not from the amyloid fibril in the system. In addition, we observe that pH has a significant effect on the foaming properties of these components. So at higher pHs, which components are highly charged, we get the highest foamability, but to get the highest stability, we need to decrease the pH into the lower pHs. So from this experiment, we understood that the best way to make these foam is to make the foam actually in high pHs to get the lowest density, and then gradually decrease the pH to lower value to stabilize this foam. Moreover, since HPS and peptides had almost the same foamability, we decided to work with HPS because it's simpler and we don't need to use, do a purification process to get pure peptides. So, a mixture of CNF and HPS at pH 8.5 were prepared. They were agitated to create the foam. And after the foam was prepared, we added gluconodeltalactone to the system. Gluconodeltalactone actually hydrolyzed in the system and gradually Form, forms gluconic acid and reduce the pH of the system to a final value of 4.5. So it makes such a stable foams that could be directly dried in the oven without collapsing. Uh, so in the next step, we were interested to know what is the stability mechanism of these foams. So we perform a QCMD measurement on the peptides to 
measure the adsorption of peptides on the CNS. And we observed that even at pH 8.5, that both peptides and CNFs are negatively charged, we still can get a significant adsorption of peptides onto the CNS. In addition to that, uh, we labeled CNFs and ANFs uh, with fluorescent dyes, and then we performed the confocal microscopy. And from that confocal images, we observed that CNFs and ANFs accumulate at the air-water interface around the air bubbles, with the ANFs mostly oriented toward the inside of the air bubbles. From these two experiments, we were able to actually suggest a stability mechanism for our system. So at the beginning, when we start agitation, in the system we have peptides, ANFs, and CNFs. But then, since peptides and ANFs are surface active, they start to move toward the interface and accumulate at the interface. But at the same time, peptides adsorb onto the CNFs and make CNFs surface active, so CNFs will also move to the interface, and they form an intertwined structure at the air-water interface, which stabilizes the foam. But this is not the only thing. We also had GDL in the structure, and to test the effect of GDL, we performed the time sweep measurement to measure the storage modulus of the foam components over time, with GDL and without GDL. So when we didn't have any GDL, we didn't see any improvement in the mechanical properties. But in the presence of GDL, the mechanical properties had a significant improvement over time. This is because, this is because when there is no GDL, Probably the pH of the system was 8.5, so both CNFs and ANFs and peptides were negatively charged, and they form a loose structure around the air bubbles. But by adding GDL, the pH gradually decreases to a final value of 4.5. At this pH, the charges of CNFs are screened, so they get much closer to each other. In addition, ANFs are positively charged at this pH, so there is also an interaction between CNFs and ANFs, and it improves the elastic modulus of the system. The foams that were prepared were not water stable until now. So to make them water stable, we had two options. One was to use a crosslinker in the system, so we use BTCA to form these ester linkages and cross-link the structure. The other option was to actually modify CNFs, so they themselves act as a cross-linker in the system. So we made dialdehyde carboxymethylated CNFs and incorporated them in the structure. So dialdehyde CNFs form, hemi form hemiacetal linkages and imine linkages and cross-link the structures. With both methods, we were able to make low-density foams with high porosity, a porosity of above 99%. We also analyzed the porous structures of the foams by X-ray tomography that you see on the right. Uh, both foams were wet stable, but the foams that were cross-linked by dialdehydes were much stronger, had higher, stronger, at higher with the strengths, but on the other hand, the foams that were cross-linked with BTCA, they had higher water holding capacity, and that's probably due to the higher charge of these foams that were cross-linked by BTCA. Okay, all these projects so far were based on cellulose nanofibrils. So as the final project, uh, we focused on doing something with fibers, because it's easier and more energy efficient to work with fibers instead of the fibrils. Since uh, the charge of the fibers has a significant effect on the properties of the fibers, from swelling, fibrillation, mechanical properties, and in our case, on its interaction with different materials, the goal of our final project was to make fibers with extremely highly charged by grafting acrylic acid by polymerizing acrylic acid onto the fiber. Uh, this modification process had three steps. Step one was malylation. In this step, malic anhydride was grafted onto the fiber in uh, presence of acetic acid as the solvent. 
The use of acetic acid as a solvent enabled the reaction to perform without the, the need to use any catalyst in the system. By grafting molecular nitride on the system, we could simultaneously add carboxylic acid groups and also alkene groups on the structures. These alkene groups in the next step were used to perform a thiolation. So DTT, dithiotriethyl, was grafted on the fiber on these alkene groups. And finally, in the last step, these tile groups were used to polymerize acrylic acid from the fiber. The polymerization was a radical polymerization where we used ammonium persulfate as the initiator and TEMAD as the catalyst. And the polymerization occurred both either in the bulk of the system or from the fiber by a radical transition mechanism to the tile group. By using different amounts of acrylic acid in the system, we were able to control the charges of the fibers from 0.75 up to even 6.7 millimoles per gram. This value of charges is so high and it cannot be achieved by the usual modification method like tempo oxidation or carboxymethylation. Uh, although the charges were high, the we didn't see uh, any effect from the fibrillation or dissolution of the fibers. Uh, the grafted molecular anhydride group on the fibers uh, could be actually be cleaved off. So by treating the fibers in one molar lithium hydroxide solution, we were able to cleave off the molecular anhydride or all the other molecules that were uh, connected to molecular anhydride. So we uh, treated thiolated fibers and acrylic acid polymerized fibers in one molar lithium hydroxide solution. For the thiolated fibers, we were able to completely detach everything that was attached to the fibers, but for the fibers that were polymerized, we were able to cleave off 80% of the polymers. And that's probably because Acrylic acid oligomers are large, and it's probably more difficult to take them out of the fiber wall, especially those that are farther inside the fiber wall, or if they are cross-linked somehow, it would be much more difficult to do that. And finally, as a proof of concept, the adsorption capacity of these fibers for methylene blue as a model live was tested in the pH value of 2.5 to 8.5. At pH 2.5, since the majority of acrylic acid groups on the fibers are not ionized, we get the lowest adsorption capacity, which was around 300. But at pH 8.5, where more than 85% of acrylic acid groups were ionized, we could get an adsorption capacity of up to higher than 1,000 mg per gram. This value of charges is significantly higher than the adsorption capacity of cellulose-based materials, is higher comparable with carbon-based materials. And there are a few reports from uh, some metal organic frameworks that have the same adsorption capacity as the fibers. However, those metal organic frameworks are difficult to prepare, and they usually, the, their preparation need toxic solvent and high temperature. So to summarize my work, uh, we showed that MLBL deposition is an efficient method to deposit very smooth, precisely controlled nanoscale field on the surface of the structures. We showed that heat-treated beta-lactoglobulin is a very interesting biopolymer due to its diverse surface functionality and its surface activity. So it can be used actually as natural foaming agent. We also showed that by malleolation of the fibers, alkene groups are grafted onto the surface, and they can be utilized for grafting different types of vinyl monomers onto the surface. And finally, by grafting of uh, polymers onto the fibers, we can create highly charged fibers without dissolution or defibrillation of the fiber wall. Finally, I am here today because of these amazing people. I would like to thank my supervisors, Lars and Per, for all their help, support, and basically everything. I would like to thank 
Peter Olston for all his insights in polymer chemistry. I had the chance for work with the best co-authors and collaborators, so I would like to thank Maria, Cornelia, Guxu, and Maria for all of their help with the project. I would like to thank Mr. Tara Kilin for financing my project and all the collaborators that were involved. And finally, I would like to thank all my friends and colleagues at Fiber Technology Division and, of course, my family and my husband. Thank you.